Welcome back, Alan Brockstein's with me now. He is the Chartered Financial Analyst at Invest420. Alan, how are you today? I'm doing great. Nice slow Friday, James. Yeah, it, it is really slow out there in the marketplace. What's, uh, what's, uh, what's, your, what's your take on the, on the action today in the cannabis space? I'm not seeing a lot of action today, really. I'm seeing a, a lack of uh, reaction to what I thought was some interesting news out of uh, Germany. Uh, you know, it's, it's a small amount of cannabis uh, on the surface for sure, but uh, kudos to uh, Marican, Aurora, and Afria for winning those uh, initial lots. Right, so uh, give, us, uh, give us an update. What, is, what happened in, uh, in Germany? Well, so Germany's been delayed and delayed and delayed, and they, they finally announced their initial tenders. Uh, like I said, it's, it's not a lot of cannabis, but it's a first step, and uh, you know, I think it puts those three comp companies in maybe front-runner position over time, uh, so we'll see how it plays out, but definitely, uh, at a very minimum, a validation of, of those three companies. There were apparently 77 bidders. Right. Huh. Well, I guess uh, it is a step in the right direction. Are you surprised by how, lo how long this legislation has been delayed in Germany? Oh, I'm kind of used. To, I don't know German uh, politics that well, James, but I'm pretty used to uh, government delays. So no, the answer is no without knowing a lot. Right. Um, okay. So do you think that this is, uh, you know, is this going to catalyze uh, more momentum in the European Union generally, or do you think this is going to just result in a, okay, Germany's doing it, let's wait and see how their experience goes before we move forward? No, I, I think Germany really sets the stage. It's not the only way for companies to get into the EU. Uh, you know, Tilray and a few others are in Portugal. Uh, you know, Malta is an up and coming uh, way to get into, uh, in, into the EU, but uh, you know, clearly Germany is going to have production on the ground, and this is a first step for that. And Germany's the largest country, and uh, I think it's going to be pretty exciting. There's some other countries too, like Denmark, that are already on board. But uh, make no mistake, I mean, the, the European market is huge compared to Canada, let's say. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. there's 502 million residents of uh, the e European Union. So when people yeah. say to me, which is a common refrain, then they say, yes, and we're in California, which is the largest market in the world. I like to say, well, except for the one that's actually 10 times bigger than California called Europe. <laughs> right. Well, it depends on how you define it, but that's true. Sure. But, you know, they're describing a market. You can go regional. You can go national. You can go international. Exactly. You sure. can go continental. Yeah. Arguably, <laughs> arguably, that would make uh, North America, I think, the most populous continent in terms of, oh no, it would be Asia, but Asia's not really making any moves towards cannabis, even though I read a story in The Economist yesterday, which to my surprise uh, informed me that China is in fact the world's largest grower of legal hemp. Yeah, I know. That, that's uh, pretty well known, actually, but people don't like to talk about it. Uh, there's fears about the... Uh quality there, I don't know. But, uh, you know, the big story this week, James, was uh, clearly uh, more M&A in the United States. It was just a few weeks ago that uh, Harvest catalyzed its stock with that out of the blue acquisition of Verano Holdings. This week, uh, Cresco, which had already filled a void in its portfolio by buying a private company in Florida, filled an even larger void, one that remains for other uh, MSOs, and that's in California. And uh, I'm sure your listeners know they, they're buying Origin House, which has been one of my favorite stocks for a long time, so I was glad to see that. Yeah, we had yeah. Uh, we had actually Mark Lustig graced us with his presence the day of, so that was uh, that was a revelation. And actually, I, I've been spending the last couple of days with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Nalink Ja, and he is the CEO of Green Relief, which is at this point is a private Canadian LP. Uh, they're somewhat noteworthy for the fact that they grow their cannabis uh, via aquaponic means, meaning with, uh -huh. in the presence of fish who provide the fertilizer. Right. And yep. uh, it's an interesting story because Dr. Ja is, uh, is a uh, neurosurgeon and a, uh, and a behavioral economist, and he actually sits on a board that uh, uh, advises, um, you know, advises globally. He's one of the worldwide experts in uh, traumatic brain concussions. And so 
we've been having a long conversation about the future of, uh, of and the promise of cannabis for that, the widening sort of uh, bio, biological, biotech uh, applications. Um, but so, yeah, so very interesting there. Um, so do you think that the, uh, you know, the deal with Cresco and, oh, my point there was that uh, Mark, uh, Mark um, Lustig, the CEO of Origin House, had invested in, not in Green Relief, but in one of the subsidiaries. So we'll be bringing more ah. coverage of that, and I'll, I'll try to get some time with you. You're coming up to Toronto for the uh, Benzinga conference, where I think you're keynoting, aren't you? Yeah, I'll be there, and I'll be there for 420. Yeah, right, of course. Uh, great, well, I'll look forward to seeing you then. Um, now tell me, uh, so this deal with, with uh, Cresco and Origin House, that was the largest public company transaction in, uh, in history in the United States, wasn't it? Uh, well, no, but for the cannabis space, yeah. Right, well, that's right, that's what I meant, sorry. You got me there. Uh, okay, so now, do you think that that makes Cresco more attractive as a, uh, as a, as a buy for longer-term investors at this point? I, you know, it's hard for me to say. These, these MSOs are really tough. It's, uh, you know, uh, I don't think investors really know them very well. We haven't seen a lot of operating history because most of them just came public. Origin House was obviously a little bit earlier, so people know that story fairly well. I think uh, you know anybody that was looking for flaws in Cresco would have probably you know said they don't have Florida and they don't have California, and so now they check those boxes. Uh, I mean, I I thought before that Cresco was certainly a top contender, and uh, I think this probably validates that even further. Uh, I, I would just caution. One of the things I've been telling my subscribers at 420 Investor is to just be a little bit careful in the MSO space and uh, be cognizant that a lot of these stocks have very thin floats. And so the momentum traders can get hold of, and I'm not trying to pick on Cresco necessarily, performed very well after the acquisition. Harvest did very well after their acquisition, and now they announced the financing. So just be cognizant of uh, tight floats and the need to raise capital over time in general. And uh, so the bottom line is you don't need to chase these stories, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Okay, do you think that the valuation that Origin got, do you, how would you categorize that? Fair, high, low? I was a little disappointed. It was in uh, my longer term focus model portfolios. I had, uh, as a CFA, you're not allowed to use the word promise, so I never would have used that word, but I, I basically had told my subscribers to expect a new all time high, which was achieved just before the deal. Uh, but I was really looking for it to get to a billion U.S. Uh, on its own. So I think, uh, you know, Origin House definitely had its pick of the, the litter and uh, went with Cresco. I, I have a feeling Mark's a very smart guy. Uh, he's been in the space working very hard for a while. And uh, while I was disappointed and I told him with the actual price that he got in terms of 0.8428 shares of Cresco, uh, if you look at the relationship between those stocks, you know, that was pretty close to the low. That's still pretty close to the low. Uh, with that said, I think it says a lot about what Mark Lustig and his uh, team and, and the board of directors must think about Cresco as, as a partner for the long term. I think uh, having watched Mark for uh, several years now, I, I don't think he was ever uh, in this for a short term. So I, I would. Uh, say that the disappointing price in the short term, uh, I bet you Mark would say it would be addressed in the long term. Right, right. That's, uh, that's a common refrain. We've heard, uh, you know, Hexo taking out a new strike with no premium. Ah. That's yeah, the know. argument. But I've got yeah. to think that for the, uh, for the, for the newer investor, it's a, just a tremendous disappointment. Yeah. Well, and I had a position in, a, in a, I have a model portfolio that's just focused on LPs and you know, I saw that, and I've been really warming up to Hexo. I mean, people that follow me know uh, uh, it just hasn't been one of my favorite stories, but I, I really like that deal. Uh, one of the weaknesses in Hexo, and there's a lot of strengths, but one of the weaknesses, in my opinion, has been reliance on a single facility uh, as well as on a single buyer, Quebec. And uh, the Hexo deal, and I, I was sorry, New Strike deal. I was never a huge fan of New Strike, but it, the stock was very cheap. They're one of the higher revenue generators, and they have a nice runway. That was a nice deal, and uh, I think anybody following the space should 
think more highly of Pexo now. They got a great deal, and it was a good strategic fit. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's put on our speculation hats now. Uh, who do you think is right for uh, either being taken over or being a consolidator? Uh, on the takeover side, you know, I, I've, I've said for a while. I, I came out with a while uh, a while ago. I came out with a list, and uh, three of the names on the list were Emblem, CanTrust, and Organogram. Well, Emblem was acquired. Uh, I think there might have been a fourth one on there as well. It might have been Hexo, believe it or not. But uh, at this point in time, I, I think both Organogram and and CanTrust certainly have a viable path forward without being acquired, but uh, I would put them at the top of the list. They're both leading companies that have proven themselves in many ways, uh, CanTrust's recent stumble notwithstanding. And uh, the valuations for anybody looking, if any sort of strategic player looking to get into the market, you know, obviously Aurora is still out there uh, and Tilray is very large players that don't yet have those strategic uh, relationships like uh, Kronos and Constellation, mm -hmm. but I, I would think a very large strategic buyer, which could come out of the farm, pharmaceutical industry, uh, you know, might want a lower price tag. Uh, so those two have a, a much lower price tag than their larger peers, uh, and you know they're trading cheaper by any number of metrics. Right. Um, do you think that Aurora's uh, share structure is a uh, impediment to their acquisition if a dan with a major globalized dance partner, partner, assuming that that's what they're after? I suspect, uh, just because I have you know a lot of conversations with uh, various elements of management at Aurora on a regular basis, they really give me the impression that they're not. They're not out there looking for that big dance partner per se. They rather like to think that they can go out and attract a, w a wide range of dance partners across a bunch of different sectors. And so they're not in a hurry. Uh, certainly they've demonstrated the ability to access capital on increasingly reasonable terms. That last debt deal was, uh, was, was not onerous in terms of dilution, unless, of course, they're unable to make that big payment in uh, five years. But, uh, you know, the whole market could be a very different place in five years. I think within five years, we might uh, have already gone through the big consolidation where all of the, the era of the, you know, the startup that goes from 100 million to a billion in, in six short weeks. I think that might be in the rearview mirror sooner rather than later, and so companies like Aurora have a better chance. Do you, do, would you say that that's in line with where, what you think, or do you think uh, that we're still likely to see a lot of, uh, of uh, high-impact speculations come through? So Aurora's not paying me to tell them what to do, but I, I would tell them not to do one of those strategic deals. Uh, I, when I think back to like what the alcohol industry's done since uh, Prohibition was ended, and you know, why sell out now? Uh, the only problem that companies have, in my opinion, right now, is uh, you know access to really large amounts of capital. Can you imagine if, if Aurora wanted to be on the same footing as uh, as Canopy Growth? Where are they going to get five billion dollars? Because everybody's all excited about the the cash. So there'd be a lot of dilution to raise that kind of money without any near-term payoff. But people don't, uh, that invest in Kronos and Canopy, you know, don't seem to be bothered by that they essentially gave up control of a company. So. Uh, maybe somebody will acquire all of Aurora. I certainly am not planning on that. And uh, I think we've seen other types of deals. Tilray and Hexo have uh, done collaboration deals that didn't involve equity at all, uh, but uh, joint investment, things like that. And uh, I, I would think that the Pelts uh, advisory would not be to necessarily find a strategic buyer per se. I, th I think that the company line of trying to do lots of deals across multiple industries is, is probably the smart route to go. Right. Well, time will tell. There's, uh, it's a, if it's a, it might be a little quiet today, but I think in the macro picture, it's a very dynamic market, probably one of the most dynamic uh, markets in the world currently. Um, all right, Alan. Well, I really appreciate the conversation as usual. I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, first time thanks. ever. We've never met. Oh, that's no, no, no. I did meet you at the first Benzinga conference, didn't I? Uh, 
don't, if you were there, you were at the first one in Toronto? I don't think you were there. I was there for like 10 minutes. Well, and now I'm very disappointed. I would remember meeting you. Yeah, well, actually, that's right. I do recall that when I was there, so that play, that where that venue was just down the street from my office. So I ran down to see what the what the attendance was like, and I remember seeing you on stage, and that was the moment when I realized, oh, Alan Brockstein's uh, partnered up a bit here with Ben Zinga, and I was like, well, that's interesting. That was my big <laughs> revelation for the day. But then I had to get back to the office to do this show. So <laughs> that was that. Look forward to meeting you this time. Same, Alan. I look forward to it, too. We'll see you soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>